to thank everyone again for joining part nine of the Almond Board Training Tuesday series. Our topic today is application best management practices, where we will cover air blast sprayers and ground rig sprayers. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Lynn Wunderlich. Lynn is a UC Cooperative Extension Farm Advisor for the Central Sierra region. Um, I should note that Lynn leads a spray application pest management alliance team that brings valuable information regarding sprayer calibration, efficacy, drift reduction, amongst many, many, many other things to growers throughout California. Um, a big note here is that her team recently was awarded the Integrated Pest Management Achievement Award by the Department of California, Department of Pesticide Regulation. Okay, so, um, so we'll get right into it. Uh, maximizing effectiveness. Uh, with spraying. And to me, that means maximizing coverage while minimizing drift. And, um, and this should equate to return on investment. And so there's a lot of things that go into um, air blast sprayer calibration or any kind of sprayer uh, calibration, including understanding your, your equipment, how it works, checking the calibration variables to be sure they are accurate and adjusting as needed, rechecking by measuring coverage. So I include measuring coverage as an important part of calibration. It's verifying your calibration parameters that you set up. And so those are the two main points I'm going to cover today, checking the calibration variables and rechecking by measuring coverage. But there's other things to consider. Um, changing your setup for growth stage and canopy, we'll touch on that a little bit. Considering weather, is it a spray day? <laughs> um, probably for many of you, most days are spray days, but there are several reasons why you may want to put off doing a spray, especially if an inversion exists. That would be a no spray day under any circumstances and communicating with your spray team. Um, so that's an important part, critically important part of uh, maximizing the effectiveness of your spraying. So as Drew mentioned, um, I have been leading a pest management alliance team. We just recently finished that um, project and an important part of that project was developing an online training that's available to you for free if you don't require CEUs. And the easiest way to access the training is to go through our UC IPM website. If you go to the home page, there'll be an online training uh, on this uh, left-hand um, uh, menu. And you'll come to this page and it's the first uh, course listed, Air Blast Sprayer Calibration Training. Um, this link, will take you to the course, which is housed on the e-extension website. And if we have time a little bit later, I'll, I'll walk through and go how to access the website. If you do want CEUs to uh, complete this training, that's available for a reduced price right now for $30 until October 31st. It is a two and a half hour course, and it provides two hours of, of other and a half hour of laws. So. Uh, we go into, you know, equipment, um, of course, the calibration. We give you a practice using a na navel orange worm uh, in almonds, should you choose that one. Uh, we go through weather parameters, team communication, and drift. So quite a bit of information there. So talking about calibration, um, calibration De the definition of calibration is to select, verify, and maintain your sprayer setup for a known, desired, and uniform application. So when we're calibrating, this is what our goal is, a known, desired, and uniform spray application. So that seems pretty straightforward until you really look at what's involved with calibrating, right? So this selection process, we're selecting our 
speed, our tractor speed, our ground speed. We're selecting our fan settings, our nozzle, our flow rate settings at a, at a particular pressure. Perhaps, you know, whether we want to use, um, you know, a scoop or not, or maybe we're using an app to help us do those, select those parameters for us. But um, invariably, there's some math in calibrating. And then we have this critically important step of verifying those parameters. Because um, as you'll see, we typically make an assumption as to what canopy volume we think is necessary for good coverage. And then we want to verify whether that assumption was correct, whether our parameters are correct. So we verify all our parameters. We, we double check our speed, our flow rate. We use water sensitive paper to verify coverage. And then we go back and forth here, maybe a few times on the selection process until we really got it dialed in. And that's actually where you can save money. If you, you know, complete, if you approach calibration, not as something where you assume the round numbers, 100 gallons, 75 gallons, 150, 200. You might start there, but in the process of verifying, you can actually dial it in more closely to what you actually need. And you might be surprised at, at, at what that number actually is and then improve your return on investment. So this is really where you can save some money. And then the, the whole rest of the time we're maintaining those parameters, right? So whether you maintain them physically yourself by um, you know, maintaining ground speed or whether you use a uh, remote controller or maybe you use a fancy, uh, the fancy Gus, you know, the unmanned, system sprayer you that's that you know what gus is doing is just maintaining those parameters that you set up you still have to set and verify those parameters and then what happens well the canopy conditions change um and that's going to require you to start this process all over again so it's really a dynamic process and i think um calibration is a uh, continuous feedback process and we don't often think about it enough you know instead we focus on the math and there is math um, involved in calibration and my presentation um, hopefully gives the audience the spray team out there today and i don't i don't really know who you are but i i have a feeling that some of you are probably supervising spray uh, um, calibrations some of you are actually setting up the sprayer. Perhaps some of you are pest control advisors that I think do have a role in this process, are part of the spray team. Um, so, you know, whoever you are in the spray team, you may not actually be doing the math, but someone has to do the math. So my presentation includes the concepts of calibration for those who maybe aren't doing the math, as well as some examples of the nitty gritty of you know, what you need to do to, to calibrate. Okay, so I use the fundamental relationship for calibration, and this is uh, a relationship that was um, taught to me by my former professor uh, at UC Davis, Ken Giles, and uh, probably many of you know Ken, um, I did my master's degree in, at Davis in the plant protection and pest management program under Ken, uh, who of course is an engineer. I myself am not an engineer. I was a pest management student, but I love this way of looking at calibration um, because it doesn't require memorizing any numbers, right? It's, it's a way of thinking about the concept and getting the concept of what we're trying to achieve. And the relationship is this, spray volume in gallons per acre is equal to the flow rate over the land rate. So that's all I have to remember. Flow rate over land rate gives me, gives me my GPA. And it's a relationship and you can see that here in the algebraic equation, right? So the gallons per acre is a direct relationship with the nozzle flow rate. What does that mean? As the nozzle flow rate increases, 
your GPA is going to increase. As the nozzle flow rate decreases, the GPA is going to decrease. It's a di direct relationship. So for some reason, your nozzle is plugged, <laughs> your gallons per acre is going to decrease because you have plugged nozzles. If your nozzles are worn, your intended gallons per acre is going to increase over what you calibrated it for because it's a direct relationship. The relationship to GPA is indirect with the land rate. What this means is it's opposite, sort of like a seesaw. So as your land rate increases, your gallons per acre decreases. And as your land rate decreases, your GPA increases. Now, is everybody with me? Because I can just see my screen. I can't see any, I've, um, I can't see any faces or any chat or anything. So, Drew, let me know if I'm, if we're good. I think we're good. No questions yet, and definitely following along. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, as Drew said, I'm hoping that this can be interactive. It's um, such a strange time now that we can't be. Do I prefer to do this in person in the field, but this is uh, also um, has some benefits. OK, so you can see my screen, for example, hopefully. <laughs> OK, so spray volume, flow rate over land rate. That's how we get GPA. Well, flow rate is from the nozzles, but land rate is what's that? You know, and and this is, you know, it's not we know it's a rate, right? It's a it's over time. We've got gallons per minute, acres per minute. So it's acres per minute. Um, and when I ask folks what's required for calibration, everybody understands that ground speed is a required parameter for calibration. And that's correct. Ground speed is part of land rate, but it's not everything. Because when we're talking about conventional calibration, how we look at labels today, labels today are per acre uh, pesticide rate per acre. It's a two dimensional, it's an area covered by the nozzles over time. So it's not just tractor ground speed, it's the area covered by the nozzles per unit time. And how do we get this area, right? So we have to use our row spacing multiplied by our tractor speed to give us that uh, area per minute or acres per minute. And the way we do this using the formula is to measure the speed in feet per minute, multiply that by our row width spacing. So row width in feet, that gives us square feet per minute covered as the as the spray rig is moving down. If you can imagine it moving down the the uh, aisle, you're covering an area over time, and that area can be thought of as an acres per minute. So this is the so that's that's a key point. A lot of people miss that, um, but row width is required for this formula: speed times row width. And that's simple. That's the that's the fundamental relationship. Gallons per acre equals flow rate over land rate. So, and I realize that probably for most of you, unless you've heard me or Ken talk about calibration this in this way, you probably haven't seen this formula before, or you haven't right. realized. Yes. And we have a question from Ron. Ron, if you want to unmute yourself. Oh, I'll go back. I'm listening, Ron. Let me see if I can help. Um, or in the chat. Yeah, you're welcome to drop it in the chat too, Ron, if you'd like. Well, maybe I'll I'll keep going, and if you okay. want to. But in, that's fine. Maybe okay. I'll answer the question. Um, so I wanted to get to this. So this is this is our fundamental relationship, flow rate over land rate. It distills down into gallons per minute over, which from the nozzles over speed times row width, right? If you do the algebra to solve for flow rate, 
you end up with this formula, right? So you just solve for flow rate, it equals GPA times speed times row width. If you use miles per hour for your speed, you'll come up with what I call the 495 or the 990 formula. And in my experience, this is the most commonly one used out there. And it's the same formula. It's just um, an algebraic uh, reiteration of it using speed in miles per hour. And the 495 is a conversion factor. So it's really the same formula. And I, I don't have any problem with people using this formula. If that's what you're comfortable with, that's fine. But the only, oh, I should I should step back. I do have a problem with people using this formula. And the reason I do is because people often then jump to solving for flow rate. So they assume a speed and they just solve for flow rate and set up their nozzles and then away they go. And doing that misses a really key part of getting good coverage. And that's setting your ground speed. So if you just assume a ground speed without really looking at the speed that is best for maximizing your return on investment, then you miss a huge part of calibrating, probably the most important part of calibrating. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Okay, so nozzle flow rate, tractor ground speed, and row width are the variables you need to check no matter what formula or sprayer you use. And tracking your units really helps a lot. So, so I mean, it just, it, if, you, if, in, if you track your units, you can't go wrong. Okay, so let's get into measuring ground speed. So how do you do that? Well, functionally, at least 100 feet measured out in the terrain you typically spray in. Um, and then simple, simply um, set up uh, the tractor. Um, you're, you're, you've got your tank at least half full. Um, you actually should have your fan on because that'll put a little bit of drag on the engine, if it's a PTO driven at least. And then you've got someone standing here. You've got your flagging. I know this isn't a vineyard, but imagine it's an orchard. And you're going to time that that person is going to use, you know, either a stopwatch or their phone has got a stopwatch on it. And they're going to time it, that tractor, beginning exactly when a certain part, maybe the front tractor wheel hits, and then they're going to walk along with it, get that speed, right? So say you're shooting for two miles per hour. And of course, your tractor gearing limits the actual speed that you can attain, right? So it's going to be different for every tractor. And that's one reason why we need to measure it, as well as, you know, changes with terrain and, and so forth. So say the gear is B1 and you've got a time travel for 100 feet. You come up with these seconds, 33, 34, 35 seconds. You do it three times. You get an average of 34 seconds. And then you convert that to minutes. So that's 0.57 minutes. You take your distance traveled over time. This is important. Distance traveled over time, 100 feet over 0.57 minutes, because we're looking for feet per minute, and we get 175 feet per minute. So you, doing this, you kind of learn to think about speed in terms of feet per minute. And then if you want to, sure, go ahead and convert that to miles per hour if that makes, you know, is that makes you more comfortable in thinking that way. And this is actually comes out very close to our target speed of two miles per hour. Then we measure the row width. And I do recommend checking the row width because, you know, there's been several times when people will have gone and said, oh, you know, that block is you know, 22 foot spacing, and then you go and measure it and you find out, well, actually it's, you know, it's 21 and a half or whatever. So you can, you can dial that in. Um, and if whoever can mute themselves, that would help me a little bit. Um, thank you. And so then um, we're going to take our speed in, in feet per minute, multiply it by, in this example, a 22 foot row spacing, and we get our area in feet squared per minute. So 3,850 feet squared per minute, per minute. We do the conversion factor. You can look up these conversion factors. You don't need to memorize any numbers. 
and we get 0 0.08 acres per minute. That's actually the speed in terms of acres covered per minute. So land rate is really sort of productivity. If you want to think about it is how much acreage your sprayer is covering per minute. Okay, so I just want to give you a little review now. If the tractor ground speed is increased and no other adjustments to the original calibration are made, the applied spray volume per acre will. So if you set up your calibration and then for some reason the driver increases the speed and no other adjustments are made, your applied spray volume per acre will A, stay the same, B, increase, or C, decrease. Mentally think about this. Okay, and the, the correct answer is decrease. Remember that speed as well as row width is inversely proportional to our spray per acre per spray volume per acre. So if it increases, the spray volume will decrease. If it decreases, so if you go from a larger block to a smaller row spaced block and you don't change anything, your spray volume will increase. So those blocks will be sprayed differently if you don't account for the row spacing, if you just go with the same setup. Okay, and that just shows you that again. Okay, so that's pretty simple, pretty straightforward setting ground speed. The only trick is to start thinking about it in terms of feet per minute. But what about thinking about your canopy and your sprays and how they actually change during the year? So a bloom time spray is not, obviously not the same spray as this type of spray. And I assume that you don't set it up the same way. The question I have for you all is, do you just change your nozzles? Do you just add more nozzles to account for that? Because that would be a, a mistake. And here we go with thinking about the importance of considering ground speed as a part of your calibration. And that's because ground speed is really the result of an interaction between the ground speed, the canopy, and the fan. So is your fan large enough to handle the canopy that you're asking it to handle? Um, and what does that canopy look like? And this is a really important concept. And so how do we how do we think about, you know, what's the job of the fan? Is it our friend or our foe? I like to ask that question, friend or foe? And the answer, I think, is really, well, it could be both or either, depending on the the spray day and depending on your settings. So the jobs, the job of the fan is really to transport those droplets to the target, to open up the canopy, to increase spray penetration, right? So you need to give the fan enough time to do its job here. You need to give it enough time to open up the canopy as, as you're moving along, to propel those droplets by putting air in motion, to work against drag. And for air shear sprayers, the fan actually atomizes the droplets. It creates the spray. Now there's cost to that and potential problems. You need to power to move the fans, right? So uh, about up to, I think, 30% or so of your, um, your engine power, if you're using a tractor PTO, your tractor or is is used to power the fan, right? So the bigger the fan, the more power it needs. It takes a lot of diesel to do that. And you obviously want to make sure that your fan is sized for the job that you're asking it to do. And and actually, if you can make sure it's it's just not too big, not too small, but just right, you'll increase your return on investment, obviously. The airspeed needs to be high at the exit point to work against drag, but the airspeed quickly drops off, right? So to keep that airspeed going, to propel those drops up into the upper almond canopy, that's going to cost you some energy as well. Too much air can blast the droplets right through the canopy or cause shingling of the leaves. Too little air, the fan is too small or the canopy too big to be effective. So how much air, and there are theoretical volumes 
for calculating um, air volume, but no one does that. We wouldn't expect you to do that. Instead, and this is uh, my friend Jason DeVoe and Tom Wolf, and, and Jason and Tom um, have the Air Blast 101 website, which I encourage you to check out. Um, here, Jason is setting flagging into the into the upper canopy. So we use flagging to help us determine our ground speed. And you can do this um, using a, a PVC pole. This is at one of our trainings. We did this. We attached flagging to the top of the pole. You can't see that in this picture here, but it's up at the top. Um, and here you can see it here. Um, and this is a, a really handy tool for uh, looking to see whether we have our ground speed dialed in, right? So <clears throat> we're looking for movement of the flagging as we're going past with the fan running, right? So, and the flagging movement, you can see this better in this picture here in the grape canopy. And the next picture I have is a piece of flagging in an almond orchard. But you're looking for flagging that's kind of right here and in, in you know not this because this if it's if it's over about 45 degrees uh it's air is too fast too much you can actually speed up your ground speed or um reduce your fan air if you have that option if it's not moving much at all if it's hanging down here you need to slow down okay you need to slow down or, and or you need to increase your fan gear or your fan RPMs or get a bigger fan to tackle that canopy. And here, here's that. I, I'm sorry this photo is blurry, but here's a piece of flagging in an almond canopy. And that's what you, you might be just looking for a little bit of flutter to know that you're actually, your air is penetrating through the canopy, reaching the other side of of the almond um, where you expect it to hit, right? Where those so then I have a question for you. Sure. Looking at that photo, so I've seen two different methods or objectives that growers may be trying to achieve. So one would be exactly this, the PVC pipe and at different levels or intervals in the canopy, you have the flagging. Then there's the wrapping, the sensitive paper around the nut that you showed uh, Franz's photo of a little bit earlier. So what's the difference in objective there? Um, there's, there's not a difference in objective. Both satisfy the same thing, okay. except that you can't at this point, you're, you're, because you're looking because where the air goes, so, so does the spray, right? So, but, at, uh, so, but it's a little bit more fine. So it's more fine tuned when you're using the water sensitive paper, you're also incorporating the flow rate, your nozzles. Okay. At this point, you're just setting your ground speed. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So you you need both, but the water sensitive paper is going to help, and we're going to show that a little bit later. That's where you really take into account both ask both variables, right? So the the flow rate and the land rate. At this okay. point, we're just setting the speed, and that's so it's a and it's easier it's easier to use the flagging to set the speed because. Yeah. You could see the air, whereas okay. with the water sensitive paper, you can't see the air, right? So okay. if you had water sensitive paper up there, it really wouldn't help you set the speed yeah. or it would be more trouble. So the water, the water sensitive paper is more about trying to track deposition on the nuts, let's say at that point. So how much deposition or landing are you getting in your target area? Sure. That's yes. what it would give you. Okay. Yes. And Perfect. if you, if you incorporate this step first yeah. chances are you'll have a more accurate deposition on that water sensitive paper when you get to that step yeah because your ground so, speed is appropriate yes yeah. okay yeah. perfect appropriate Thanks. for the canopy and for the fan right yeah. okay so um so that's dialing in our land rate we've we've taken care of that part of the equation now in order to solve for flow rate we have to make an assumption about GPA, right? So typically people, you know, they, as I said, you, you use a round number um, or you use your experience, right? So you, you make an assumption, you make an estimate based on eyeballing the canopy, 
but then you verify it later once the nozzles are chosen. You don't just walk away from that and go, oh, that's that's what it is. You verify it because this is an assumption, right? And you have to make an assumption. We have to have two of these variables assumed for us to calculate flow rate, All right? So let's assume, and I, I just came up with this as I was creating this PowerPoint. I don't really know what volumes are typical for you guys. I'm assuming it changes during the season. And of course, with the orchard and the variety and the stature of your trees, I kind of came up with a large volume because I didn't didn't want to be grape centric. <laughs> so I'm coming up with 200 gallons per acre is my target volume based on estimating my canopy. I've already set my ground speed. I know that I like that speed um, of 0 0.08 acres per minute. And then we just solve for X and we get 16 gallons per minute for the total sprayer or eight gallons per minute per side, right? So, and then, you know, you're, you're also going to use some tools here, a piece of PVC to help you adjust where those nozzles, the angle of the nozzles, that's going to be critically important for you. Um, you can use flagging here. Here's a training with my friend, Matt Stramiska, where we put flagging here. And again, where the air goes, so goes the spray. Um, so you can uh, do some adjustments and some selection of how many nozzles you want to choose to use to give you that volume. And then we're going to get into nozzles. So typical disc and core nozzle here with, um, this is how it would look if you were inserting it into the sprayer, right? So here's the core with the nib facing you. So that's how it should be done. And then the, the strainer would go in next and then it would get placed into the sprayer, right? So what does the nozzle contribute to our spray application? Well, really two things, uh, primarily flow rate, of course, we've already talked about, it's directly proportional to application rate. So if we want our larger spray volume, we increase the flow rate either by choosing a larger nozzle size, and that's um, would also give us larger droplets, except for Venturi sprayers where droplets are always fine, or increasing the pressure. Um, but that would give us smaller droplets, and that's only for small changes in flow. And I'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, and the second thing the nozzle contributes is droplet size. And this is where, you know, coverage versus drift, that conundrum that growers face daily, right? We're trying to improve, maximize our coverage, but we also have to be increasingly uh, concerned about drift. Um, and this is a droplet size is a little bit tricky to document with air blast sprayers because we have the fan involved and the fan shears the drop. So even with a large drop nozzle, we know that there's some air fan shearing going on. Um, so here's our, our disc core setup, the disc, uh, the core or spinner plate, two, uh, I think of this as two nozzles coming together for one flow rate, a slotted strainer here and our manifold. I showed you that already. That's how it would look in an axial fan setup. Um, and at this point, are ceramic nozzles worth it? Just get this over with. Yes, absolutely, they're worth it. Um, they do cost more, but they um, they are are they wear ninety to two hundred times longer than a brass or hardened stainless steel nozzle. And in my experience, ceramic nozzles are more accurate. I have. Uh, calibrated, I have put brand new brass or hardened stainless steel nozzles into a sprayer and measured their flow rate and have had them been significantly off, over 5% off, brand new. Whereas ceramic nozzles, for some reason, I don't know exactly why, they seem to be more accurate from the get-go. And, and I would just encourage you to shop online for your nozzles, just like you would any other piece of equipment. You can find um, nozzles uh, on sale. These are some some prices that I got recently from, I think it was Kisco. Um, you know, you can find nozzles on sale, so don't assume 
that you know you have to pay the big bucks uh, you can find them on sale you can find them ceramic ones um not that much more expensive especially when you consider your return on investment here right okay and just to mention the pressure gauge um <clears throat> i have to mention it because it's an essential component to make sure that it's operating properly that it's maintained and that it's easy to read and has a range that makes sense for the sprayer. So if you're operating at 100 PSI, your pressure gauge should reach 200, 300 PSI. She doesn't need to go up to 1,000. It will be harder to see. It will be harder for the driver to see and less accurate if, it, if it's out of range that way. And you wouldn't believe how often I go to calibrate a sprayer and the gauge is cracked or you know not maintained it's a pretty simple thing to maintain and well worth your investment there and why is that because um it tells your driver who's doing in this photo i like this photo drew thank you for sharing it with me um because it shows the typical over the shoulder check right so the pressure gauge is located back here and it's something that the driver, who's really got to pay attention to driving ahead of them, trying to do this over the shoulder check. The driver looking over their shoulder can see that pressure gauge. They know that flow is happening. Pressure is a measurement of the resistance to flow. If, if pressure is happening, they know that flow is happening. Um, if pressure isn't happening, then they know that they have a problem within the sprayer right and they need to um stop and make an adjustment look at those nozzles to see if they're clogged <laughs> and you know and then i i do want to make this point because um pressure is related to flow but it's not it's not um it's not something you need to include as a measurement as a part of the calibration it's related to your flow rate but you can have plenty of pressure and not a lot of flow, right? So I, I'll, I'll use an analogy. I'm remodeling my house. It's a 1954 house. We're doing a back room while we were back there. We've noticed that our flow in, in our, um, inside the house isn't really that good. You know, I don't have that much. The term I would use is pressure, right? The term we would use is I don't have good water pressure in my house, but you know um and then we uh, but the plumber who investigated we have these old um um not uh these old pipes they're old copper pipes in the, in the house but they're old, old um i can't remember the term not stainless steel but anyhow they're they're old pipes outside and he took that pipe out and it was all corroded inside and he measured the pressure there and he said, you've got plenty of pressure. The problem is you don't have flow. And it was like, oh, I understand this because this is the same thing I deal with in spray application all the time, you know. Um, and the, so if you need more flow, you really need to consider changing the nozzle. The orifice has to be large enough to accommodate the flow desired. Uh, no, otherwise, no matter how high the pressure gets, you're not going to get the flow, right? And that's because the relationship between flow and pressure is a squared relationship, right? So to double the flow rate, you have to increase the pressure four times or two squared. Um, so pressure is not the variable you must measure. Flow is. So pressure alone can't tell you the flow rate, the flow rate itself does. Hopefully, um, uh, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that. Okay, so a little bit review here. The three variables you must, you must measure, verify, no matter what calibration formula you use are the nozzle flow rate, nozzle pressure, ground speed, flow rate, tractor RPMs, ground speed, flow rate, swath width, ground speed, flow rate, fan air speed, ground, ground, tractor ground speed. And hopefully everyone would know that these are the three variables, right? Flow rate, swath width, and ground speed. This is your 
land rate. This is your flow rate. Okay, and another review. I'm trying to give you a heads up on the on the exam for all of those uh, here for CEUs. So what's the X variable in the basic formula for calibration? Spray volume is equal to X over land rate, fan airspeed rate, nozzle flow rate, pesticide label rate, or pressure increase rate. And hopefully everyone would say B, nozzle flow rate. Okay, flow rate over land rate. See, it's pretty easy to remember. Nozzle flow rate over land rate. That's all I need to know. Okay, so I'm... Um, um, I want to go back to where we were at here. In our example, we were shooting for 200 gallons per acre. We determined our land rate at 0 0.08 acres per minute. We calculated for a desired flow rate of 16 gallons per minute. If, say, I have 12 nozzles on my sprayer, and they all, just for the sake of an example, they all... Um, deliver the same flow rate, I would be looking for a nozzle that delivers 1.3 gallons per minute per nozzle, right? So this is our T-Jet, this is the T-Jet disc and core hollow cone um, uh, from the catalog. And I really recommend that anyone who, <laughs> who that you all have the nozzle uh, flow rate uh, chart for whatever nozzle setup you use, whether they're Greenleaf or Albus or T-Jet, whatever, they're all available online now. So there's no reason not to have them. And I kind of, um, I, I, this is a, I, I mocked this up a little bit, right? Because you guys are using bigger flows typically. So I'm starting here with the cores at 25. I skipped the, the smaller cores, but I would be looking, um, and there's a lot of extraneous information in this, uh, in these catalog uh, charts, which is really annoying to me, we typically don't spray at these low pressures or at these really high pressures. Why is that? That's because those disc and core nozzles are really made, they're engineered to work at pressures around 100 to 150 PSI. So that's where I'm gonna shoot. That's my sweet spot. And if I look down, this 100 PSI column, I see here I could use a D8 with a 45 core and get a flow rate of 1.35. That's cl pretty close, close enough. Uh, if I wanted to look at a smaller, a slightly smaller um, size, I could go with a 12 and a 25 core at 80 PSI. Uh, 1.32, so you have got some choices here. At 150, I could go with a 7 and a 45, I'd be, get there. Um, and then, or I could mix it up, you know, maybe I could use a few that give me a flow of 1.35 with a few that give me a, a little less flow. So, um, so that's reading the chart, right? So every chart has the pressure because it's a related, the flow is related to the pressure. And if you see here, if you just, just take a look at this principle of say, looking down, say, look at this, this flow of 0.44 at 40 PSI, just to illustrate this point about the relationship between pressure and flow. If I l wanted to double this flow to 0.88, look at, I'd have to increase the pressure to 150. That's why when we're making, when we want to make a change, we're desired a, a, a bigger flow rate, change the nozzle. If it's a, just a small tweaking that you need to do to get your desired flow rate, then you can go ahead and change the pressure. And I'm running behind. So I'm going to go a little bit quick, more quickly here. I chose my nozzles. I look at what the catalog tells me they're supposed to give. They give me a total of you know, a little bit more than 15 gallons per minute. So I chose four at 1.11 and eight at 1.35, according to the catalog at 100 PSI. That would give me an estimated of 190 gallons per acre. That's close enough, I think. Um, so just different charts um, to tell you. And again, 
these charts are downloadable. And what I've done for our trainings is I've, I've blown them up and laminated them. And God, that's such a nice thing to have for the guys in the field. You know, hand them a laminated chart for the nozzles they're using that's blown up so they can see the um, more easily how to choose their nozzles. We also have these single piece ceramic nozzles available. I don't know how many of you are using these now. They've been around for a while. You're seeing them more now. Um, T-Jet makes them. Albus makes them. They're nice because, uh, well, it's only one nozzle you need to choose. It's easier to put in and it's color coded. So if you're spraying at night and you need to set up your um, your manifold at night, you can just tell your your sprayer, you can say, uh, you know, by color, you can tell them how many, you know, four blacks, two greens up above, whatever it is. Kind of nice that way. The um, You will notice, though, that they don't have as great of a range of flow rates, right? So the just they're they're getting there but they just don't have you know you don't see a 1.35 here which means you just have to use more nozzles uh to achieve that overall sprayer flow rate the other thing you see on this chart is something to do with droplet size so you see the very fine fine color coding for the droplet size that these nozzles deliver all fine and droplet size is measured in microns um, and these these color codes or these symbols, don't pay attention to the color codes because it gets confusing with the colors on the on the plastic housing of these nozzles. Pay more attention to the symbols. The symbols will tell you the range of um, of typical droplet size and volume median diameter, which means, Half of the spray volume has larger droplets and half of the spray volume has smaller droplets. Um, and why does this why does this matter so much? It matters because larger droplets simply don't drift as much. <laughs> and that's that's just how it is. I mean, this is old work done by Atkinson and Yates. Um, when I showed this during our spray webinar recently, Tom Wolf, said, oh yeah, you know that I worked with them and and that's still really current valid information, right? So they did some original work to show the time required to fall 10 feet and lateral movement in a three mile per hour wind, which we would consider ideal spray conditions. And you see that these fine droplets will move, will stay in the air longer and the longer they stay in, stay in the air, the longer they have the opportunity to move off site and they'll move more than these coarser droplets, which will fall out more quickly and not drift as far. And so the larger the, the number, so the larger the disc, um, the, the larger the exit hold, the greater the flow rate and relative droplet size. So if you want larger drops, that's one way to get it. You can also choose an air induction nozzle they're available now for air blast sprayers. They've been used in Europe for a while. Um, and I've been, uh, this is a, um, I've been doing some work with these nozzles in vineyards. Um, this is the AITX, the T-Jet AITX. You can see without the fan on, right? You can see the, how large that droplet looks as compared to a disc and core. And why might you want to consider larger droplets? Well, because the deposition efficiency can increase with an increase in droplet size. Um, and larger droplets are less likely to become entrained in the airflow streamlines around the target. So if you imagine this as being your target nut and that airflow is going to, that stream of air is going to become entrained around that nut and miss it, right? It's going to miss the backside with those small droplets, you have a better chance of hitting the backside with larger droplets and with um, slower air. Um, so it, it's an option, and um, and I'm not saying it's 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 something to consider, especially in bloom time sprays, 
in sensitive areas, if you're near a school or near a sensitive area, if you're concerned about drift, you might want to look at these at these nozzles and see if they give you the coverage and the efficacy that you need. Again, um, and this chart shows the air induction nozzles. See, it shows the droplet size. So now you can get, you know, an extra coarse nozzle. You'll have to use more nozzles to attain that flow rate, but it's an option. And I've done some work with these. And um, for powdery mildew in vineyards, we saw no difference in incidence or severity um, when we substituted air induction early season compared to disc and cores. So that's a lot, I know, but now I want to get into verifying the nozzle flow rate. Uh, you've chosen your nozzles. You can see what the flow rate is in the catalog. You still need to verify these numbers, right? Anybody can do this bucket method. You fill the tank with clean water. You park it on level ground. You fill it completely full. And you make a mark where the tank is full because this is your refill line. You either can fill it to the very top here or make a mark with a Sharpie works or a piece of tape. And then you work with the driver and you, 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 you know, open up all the nozzles and start timing when the nozzles are completely opened. And this also gives you an opportunity to look and check the pressure. You note the pressure, you can see any faulty nozzles while open. If you see any nozzles that are faulty, of course, you have to stop, replace that nozzle, refill the tank and restart. And you time for about 20 seconds to, to a minute. The longer you can time, the better you'll, it, it, the more accurate your, um, your uh, actual output will, will be, measurement will be. And you stop timing only when the nozzles are off, right? So you might shoot for a minute, but it, the driver might need a little reflex time. And so it might be, you know, like 62 seconds or 63 seconds. And that's what you use. And then you use a calibrated container to refill. And this is a common container. This is one that's uh, Gempler cells. And I noticed that it has imperial units U.S. units and metric units and imperial units for volume are not the same as U.S., right? So if you go into a, a British pub, you'll get a larger pint of beer than if you go into a U.S. pub and get a pint of beer. So you want to make sure that you're um, using a calibrated container. You refill and track the number of gallons to refill, and then you carefully measure whatever is left and subtract it from your total. And um, anything that is, any nozzles, the nozzle should be within 5% or lower from the catalog, catalog flow rate at the specified pressure. So if anything more than that, replace those nozzles. Okay, so that was a quick, that's the, that's the verifying flow rate, the whole pressure, the whole sprayer, anyone can do that. You can also verify single nozzles. It requires an adapter that fits over the nozzle without impeding flow. They can be homemade like these that we made out of dishwasher uh, conversion parts and, you know, a brass um, manifold there and a, um, an O-ring. Or you can buy them, Salvarani, AAMS Salvarani makes these fancy nozzle adapters. They're expensive. Um, they work really great, especially with ceramic nozzles. And then you can hook up the hose and time it. And do I have, oh, no, I don't. Um, I thought this was a, a video, but it's not, which is probably a good thing. Um, it, these are, we have videos in our online course of all of, all of these. So you can um, use a stopwatch and a container and time the flow rate, or you can uh, purchase a spot on, which uh, you don't need a stopwatch um, to use, and uh, but you still need a really good nozzle adapter. And this provides you the flow rate. Um, oh, and I do, I have a, a video here showing the spot on. So this is, um, I really like the spot on. It's a handy little tool to use uh, 
it's uh, you have to wet this sponge, this filter at the top thoroughly before you use it. You have to hold it level, but you don't need a stopwatch, right? And so you can see I've got my Salvarani adapters. I'm measuring the flow rate of an individual nozzle in gallons per minute there, and I've got 0.57 gallons per minute. Oh, the Salvarani also makes um, this really fancy uh, 16 nozzles at once, about $7,000 when we purchased these in 2018. I know we're all whistling. Wow, that's a lot of money. Um, if you're the type of in, uh, operation, though, that has several sprayers going and you want to calibrate quickly, I think this would give you some return on your investment. You do need uh, the adapters. And you do, do need to time it with a stopwatch, but it gives you accurate, very accurate flow rates for all your nozzles and helps you troubleshoot those nozzles. Okay, if you're using a pneumatic sprayer, so a, like this um, Electroblast, a low volume Venturi or air shear, these do not have hydraulic nozzles, right? So these have air shear nozzles. And I still consider these nozzles because their job still is to meter flow. Right. So um, and this is from our online course, uh, they these electroblast, it'll have some kind of a valve to set. This is the same thing as, you know, choosing your nozzles. You're choosing your setting to determine a specific flow rate at a specific pressure. So you still need to uh, consult the, the uh, manufacturer's catalog, and you need to check the units because some of these are in gallons per hour instead of gallons per minute. And in our online course, we have this scenario where we take you through calibrating for navel orange worm and, and almonds, and we take you through using an electroblast uh, sprayer to, to figure out the calibration. Anyhow, you can still do uh, verify the flow rate. You should verify the flow rate of these um, using the whole sprayer method, the spray out the whole sprayer. You probably don't need to do this uh, individual um, nozzle method. Uh, I have had these discs be slightly off. This is a, a Gearmore uh, Chima. I don't know that these are used in almonds at all, but um, we did detect that by uh, unhooking it and measuring the flow rate here, um, but it shouldn't be that difference. It's simply a hole in the end of a pipe, right? So once you get your actual flow rates, you plug those in to your formula, right? So you add the add individual nozzle flow rates up here. You plug them into the variable here. In this case, I got about 15 gallons per minute actual flow rate. I take that over my 0 0.08 acres per minute. I get 188 gallons per acre. That would be my actual flow, uh, uh, my actual calibration. I was shooting for 200. I got 188. Um, and then I'd use that to determine the pesticide in the tank, right? So the last step is uh, referring to the label the uh, actual GPA and the tank size, you determine how much pesticide in the tank. Say our actual GPA is 188. That's what we calculated. That's what we measured. Our tank size is 500. We can do 2.6 acres per tank at that calibration. Our pesticide label calls for three to six ounces per acre. We go with four ounces. We multiply the four ounces times the 2.6 acres that we're going to cover with that tank, and we add 10.4 ounces of pesticide to the tank. I know I'm going quickly here, and I'm over time. Um, Drew, how am I doing? I'm still going to be able to get my 15 minutes in as of right now, since we're doing live questions. Um, I don't think we need to leave too much time after your presentation, so don't feel okay. too pressured. I'm almost done. I'm okay. almost done. Perfect. Um, and I apologize. I knew I had a lot to cover today. No, this is all uh -huh. good information. This is all really good information. And like I said, we haven't had, it's live Q&A. So okay. Okay, honestly, good. we don't need to budget too much time after. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I want to, I want people to ask questions if they... Yeah. They do have them. So, yep. so using the water sensitive paper, um, obviously this is a vineyard. 
the reason why I included this here is because here's my target pest. This is a mealybug in vines. I've got my water sensitive paper right there. And um, and this is these are, uh, you know, wrapping the paper around the nut idea and uh, to, to check coverage. This is way too much coverage, I would say. Um, you'd be surprised that um, I mean, some of you might really like that. And I get that. Um, but the the amount of um, of drops that you need per square centimeter is really much lower than that. Um, but it's up to you to evaluate coverage. Um, and as you get more comfortable with evaluating coverage and look at the pest control that you get, you'll feel and take notes on all of this. You'll feel like you can maybe pull back a little bit. Pulling back on volume or rate will save you money, obviously, and time. Um, you can attach the water sensitive paper on these mailing tags. Um, and I know that it's going to take a ladder or, you know, a, some kind of cherry picker thing or a P PVC pole to get it up there. I, I understand that an almond tree is not a vineyard. Um, I'm just showing you different ways to attach the paper. You can use these permanent cow ear tags that I ordered. I don't know. I got these online somehow. And then you could flag that. So if you had a particular problematic spot or a spot that you knew, say, in the tree that you always wanted to look for coverage there, you could attach this permanent tag and then, um, and then attach the water-sensitive paper to that. We've done these in trainings, you know, where we've put these poles up in walnuts, tall walnuts, and and sprayed them and then taken them down and evaluated the coverage on the water-sensitive paper. Or you can use something like kaolin clay um, or, or, or a, a tracer. But I think water-sensitive paper is really the most um, usable form. Um, I just wanted to mention again, check in with your spray team, keep good records. Um, these will help you do a good job. Here's the, uh, what the, uh, our online course looks like when you enter it on the E extension foundation campus. Um, you do need to create, um, an account. You can use your Google account. If you have a Google account. You can use your Microsoft account, which you all have because you're all on Teams, or you can uh, create an account on the campus. It's free, um, but you have to do that to get into the course. Um, all those accounts and passwords, I know, I know. And that's all I have. Downrig weed control. So really, I'm going to cover a lot of what Lynn covered, except it's slightly different when we're talking about uh, spray rig booms for ground rent applications of herbicides. Um, so here I'm going to start with tips to aid herbicide performance. When I'm talking about performance, I'm talking about minimizing drift, getting the efficacy that you're looking for, and also maximizing that return on investment for growers. That's perhaps one of the most important things is that drift reduction and efficacy all go in hand with ways to maximize return on investment. So the number one thing here I've listed is proper weed ID of any weed management or really any pest management or disease management aspect, you really want to have proper identification of the pest or disease that you're working with. And then it's herbicide timing, since we're talking about herbicides specifically or weeds. So for pre-emergence, what you're really going to want to do here is time it close to rainfall. That's perhaps one of the most important things because you really want to use the little bit of rain we get in California to incorporate those pre-emergence. Um, if you're in an area or in a drought like we are currently or heading into, you're going to want to go ahead and put on your irrigation sets to incorporate that in the top inch or so. So again, watch for foot traffic because these pre-emergence, the way they are is you need to have a uniform coverage on the soil. If you immediately spray and have someone walk through, you're going to end up having patches where you're going to see efficacy to no efficacy. Um, I think one of the most overlooked pieces, especially when we're talking about pre-emergence, is organic matter. So these pre-emergence bind to organic matter. So if you have a lot of leaf litter and you don't clean that up prior to making that pre-emergent application, 
is going to bind to those leaves and not give you the coverage you need. And then let's say a wind comes through, blows away all those leaves, you're going to have a very patchy network for where you saw the herbicide hit the soil and terminate that seed development or germination in areas where everything is going to germinate through. So for post-emergence, what we're really talking about there is, again, proper identification, but even more so is really trying to target it before these weeds get too tall or too large. At a certain point there, we're going to lose efficacy, whether we're talking about mechanical practices or whether we're talking about chemical applications. The next is spray nozzle selection. Lynn covered this in detail. Uh, same thing applies here with boom applications. Nozzle selection along with ground speed and PSI for ground rigs are the biggest, biggest things to keep track of. Um, when you're thinking about nozzle selection, use a larger droplet size when appropriate. So what do I mean by that? We're going to get into that a little bit later, but we're really talking about what you're using, what time of year. So pre-emergent, post-emergent, when we're talking about post-emergent, is a systemic or a contact herbicide. Uh, so nozzle selection also helps you in reducing drift and improve delivery to target to the target. So again, that would be your weed. Um, so really balance of droplet size, pressure and ground rig speed is what you need to put into a formula to achieve the greatest return on investment. So spray technique, this I would call the environmental and the human aspect of making a proper application. So of course we all know there's spray days and no spray days. There's a lot of environmental factors that go into that. But beyond that, it's really applicator care, attitude and skill. Um, Lynn showed that photo of an applicator looking back to make sure everything's being sprayed properly, that you don't have any clogs. And it's also just about, am I paying attention to my ground speed? Am I doing this appropriately? So again, IPM, early stages, proper identification and weed scouting. So weed scouting is definitely a huge, huge piece in any integrated weed program. Uh, while weeds are present in every orchard, there's variation in weed species, phenology, composition, and density. What I mean by that is really you're talking about a young orchard versus an old orchard. You're going to have very different species composition in an orchard where there's more sunlight hitting the orchard floor versus a mature orchard that's shaded out. So this is no surprise to anybody, but most weed species are much more challenging to manage as they mature. So this Malvus species I'm sure we're all familiar with, especially in the middles of orchard rows. So we can go through and mow this, and if we hit it early, we can terminate that. The carbohydrate reserve in that big, big root system is minimal we can terminate that, we can manage that. If we wait till it gets too old, like the image on the bottom, mowing is really just gonna create a flatter, more prostrate mouth of species where it just comes back with a vengeance two weeks later. So again, scouting should be done at the start of the season and post-harvest. And this also allows for monitoring of herbicide resistance. Uh, so proper weed ID, you're scouting, you're going out there, now make sure you're actually properly identifying those species. Uh, why is this important? So really, while they may look the same or maybe even have the same common name or portions of it, they're going to be managed completely different. Their phenology could be completely different. So a really good example of this is, again, goosegrass over here shown on the below image, the image on the left. The middle image is three spike goosegrass. So these are both Eleusine species but they differ in phenology and you could see even in their identification they look fairly similar they both have a digitate inflorescence the big difference here is this is much more compact and three spike goosegrass is a perennial so when you're thinking about managing a perennial your systemic herbicides are applied at a different time than an annual the mowing is going to have a huge difference if you're going in there mechanically trying to control the species very very different when targeting an annual versus a perennial Field bindweed, I know we're all experiencing this. It's not just a problem in orchards, it's a huge problem in tomato production systems. So this one again, phenology is a big, big thing. So what time of year is growth versus when it's going dormant? So if you're dealing with field bindweed, you really wanna target it at the point where carbohydrates are going back into the root system when you're applying a systemic herbicide. If you apply it in spring, the way systemics work are they're going to the growing tips all that energy in field bindweed is going out to the growing tip, 
nothing to do with the rhizominous nature of this species. So again, phenology is key. So again, timing is crucial. This is really, really big, and we'll get into a little bit more about nozzle selection to help mitigate some of these issues. But if you don't have the proper timing, nozzle selection and everything else we talk about is really not going to make a difference for you. It really won't. You need to target everything at the right time and think about what you're doing. So timing is crucial. Mature or tall weeds equals poor control. So then we can also talk about spray height. So high spray height equals an increased risk of drift, which equals an increased risk of crop injury. So we're not just talking about schools being an issue because that is a huge, huge component of this, but crop injury, especially when we're talking about herbicides, is something to keep track of. So you can see here in image A, this is a second leaf almond tree where we just removed the carton. So you could see this is hardened off wood. It's lignified, it's darker, it's definitely been through um, quite a bit in those two years. It's hardened off properly. This is green wood below. So what does that mean? It is susceptible to systemic herbicides and obviously contact herbicides as well. So if you're not managing drift, not thinking about your ground speed or environmental conditions or nozzle selection, you can end up with something like this. So this is a glufosinate glyphosate treatment a standard rate and you could see here every single dark spot or lesion that developed and even some gamosis was from drift same thing can be seen here in image c this is whether it was painted in image c or not painted in image b we still had a severe amount of damage and of course here we have stacked internodes which is typical glyphosate symptomology if you get that stacked internode with dense dense growth that indicates a systemic herbicide has entered the system. So calibration, Lynn talked about the 495 formula for air blast sprayers. For ground rig applications and herbicide applications, we're talking about the 5940 method. So a lot of the same components go into this. We're talking about gallons per acre times ground speed, miles per hour, times your nozzle spacing in inches and then the constant below, which really takes out and cancels out units to give you the gallons per minute that you're looking for. So again, let's go through a few examples. I know we've had a lot of math today, so I apologize. So example here, we're talking about 30 gallons per acre with what should be pretty much a standard 2.5 miles per hour with a 20 inch nozzle spacing divided by that 5940 constant. That gives you 0.253 gallons per minute. Now to convert that over to milliliters, you're going to times it by 3785. What that gives you is something to work with when you use a graduated cylinder or calibrated container, as Lynn said, to really check that you're getting that gallons per acre application out or rate. So here we are, there's 455.8 milliliters per minute. We're all busy, so for me, standing there a minute for each catch can or graduated cylinder calibration container is quite a bit of time. To do something about that, go ahead and divide it by four. Now what you're getting is per 15 seconds. So here's your millimeters per milliliters per 15 seconds. Here's another equation. We're not gonna go through that one, but you get the idea. This is a really simple, simple equation here. But what I should add is once you get this equation and you're within that 5%, maybe just a little bit over, the way to kind of tool this a little bit closer in and within that 5% margin is changing your PSI. Don't think if you have the proper nozzle selection, you have it within a 5 to 10% and you need to get it below that 5, go ahead and change your PSI to achieve the proper application rate. So nozzle selection, Lynn covered this in detail, so I'm not gonna belabor this too much, but spray nozzles are the least expensive part of any spray job, but often the most overlooked, which I think is super common no matter what practice you're talking about. So here's a chart similar to what Lynn showed. What I'm showing here is spray nozzle description, operating pressure, droplet size, drift management, and general herbicide use patterns. 
What I highlighted here in the red box is really looking at drift management as our primary way to guide us which nozzle to select. And then you could see past that in green, whether it's good for pre-emergence, systemic, or contacts. So again, PSI range is important. You can see here across the board, and then the same thing applies here with droplet size. Microns is what's used to measure this, but with TJET or other companies, what you really want to look at is this information right here at the bottom. VF, very fine. F equals fine. M is medium. C is coarse. And extra coarse is XC. To me, that's what you should be looking for, not necessarily the color like Lynn mentioned, because really what you want is to understand what is going on with that droplet size and those microns. So drift management again. I would say where we're at right now, the easiest thing to do if you look across the board for something that's going to give you the biggest bang for the buck and the best drift management along with pre-emergent or systemics is looking at these air induction nozzles. So you have air induction nozzles that are extended range or you have the twin turbo T-jet induction, which all are coarse to extra coarse, medium to extra coarse or extra coarse accordingly. So drift management, excellent coverage there. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Just due to the droplet size, it's gonna minimize your drift. Then we go over to pre-emergent systemic or contact. You can see here for an AI nozzle or air induction, it's very good for pre-emergent. Systemics, excellent. Now, why would that be? What's the difference there? So pre-emergence, you do want a fairly uniform pattern on the ground. Again, hence talking about controlling your organic matter and foot traffic, you do want a fairly uniform pattern. But once you soak it in, in that top inch or so, you're going to get fairly even distribution as long as you've cleaned the orchard floor prior. When we're talking about systemics, this you only need a few drops on a leaf surface of a weed to be able to enter the system and control that weed or manage those weeds. Contacts is a little bit different story. This is good control. Now, why? Why did it lead to that? For contacts, you're really talking about it being, just like it says, a contact application. So you do need a fairly good lather on the surface of that leaf to get the burn down effect that you're looking for. Uh, you follow down here, air induction nozzles, extended range, same thing you could see here. And then you get to the turbo T-jet induction model excellent for drift management, excellent, excellent for pre-emergence and systemics, and poor for contact. So I would definitely pay attention to these kind of tables and make sure you're looking at what you're trying to apply and what your objective is. But in general, I think a good rule of thumb are the AI or air induction nozzles are gonna get you what you're looking for. I should add down below here, the turbo twin jet, very good, excellent, very good and excellent management for drift. So again, Lynn kind of alluded to this earlier, nozzle tip wear. Nozzle tip wear depends primarily on the tip material. She definitely talked about that. So wears quickly. We have brass, then your plastic, stainless, and then ceramic and carbide. So little to no wear. So yes, they're a little bit more expensive, but the lifespan you get out of these nozzles is much, much greater if you're on this end. Okay, spray nozzle selection. So we're going to continue with that. But of course, once you've selected your nozzles and say you're working through nozzles you've had for a couple years, keep an eye out to make sure nozzles are working properly. So here's a new nozzle. You can see the fan. This image is not the best, but it will do. Here's a plug nozzle. You can see the stream or the fan is not quite so even. And then a damaged one, sure, it looks fairly close, fairly similar. And this is where that catch can or calibration container will come in hand. You really need to do that calibration prior with the nozzles you're going to make the application with so that you can catch something like this. Visually, it may look very similar to the new, but it's damaged. And you could see that slightly in some of the spray pattern down at the bottom of this fan. So why is that important? So here's the cost and returns per acre to produce almond study done for Sacramento Valley in 2019. So operating costs, we're specifically talking about operating costs for herbicides here. So if we're thinking here that this is $117 cost per acre, 
what I did here was our average grower size is about 100 acres. So let's let's use that math for this for this exercise. Average grower is 100 acres. So if we're talking about an herbicide management program, we're talking about 11,700 to treat those 100 acres. Now, if a nozzle happens to be plugged or damaged, average overage can be five to 10 percent per nozzle. So let's say one out of four nozzles happens to be defective or, or damaged. A 5% overage is going to cost that grower $146.25 versus the 10% overage. You're talking about $292.50 for those 100 acres that goes over. So again, spray technique applicator goal should be to deliver herbicides to the target accurately, uniform and effectively to reduce off target movement. So again, nozzle selection is going to help you with that drift management. And again, keep in mind those environmental conditions. That is a huge, huge piece here. And before applications and certain nozzles are adjusted appropriately for your orchard specific needs, use the proper nozzle to deliver large droplet size when drift is a risk. So here I'm just going to plug in the last two minutes upcoming events. Some of you may know that we're having a big road show, industry road show, and this is really a grower resource pickup and an opportunity to meet us out there in the field. I've only shown here this week's agenda. We have some agenda uh, time slots next week. What will be in the Central Valley and then in the Southern Valley. So please, please go onto our almonds.com about us page and look for events. Here you'll find all the time slots in the different areas will be, but we're ranging from Corning to Woodland and then on down the valley. If you'd like a free copy, if you can attend any of these and you'd like a free copy of all these resources, please email fieldoutreach at almondboard.com and you'll be sure to get every single thing in this packet here that includes our pest ID cards, which I'm going to go over briefly industry notebook, nitrogen best management practices, which is a wonderful new tool, our most recent version of growing good and other items. So again, as promised new resources. Here's the almond orchard um, pest management guidelines. So here you have pests, irrigation and spray drift. Spray drift, as we've talked about a lot today, we have a card on that. Then we have pests. This is going to give you Oh, OK, so there you see. And then there's also the natural enemies and then we have irrigation tips as well. And then I would definitely like to thank you all for attending and please, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions.